Hey guys, welcome to your vodcast for Chapter 9, the Progressive Era. Uh, the Progressive Era is a time in history where uh, government starts to change the, the way in which it dealt with society. Prior to the Progressive Era, we see a lot of um, hands-off approach, the laissez-faire approach that we've talked about in class before. Um, but right around 1890, that begins to change. Businesses were, were okay with the uh, laissez-faire approach, but the people who suffered the most because of it were the citizens. And so... Um, finally, the citizen's voice is heard over business's voice, and we start to see government intervention, and that's that's what defines the progressive era. A lot of social changes, a lot of changes in um, state, local, and, gov and federal government reform. Um, so let's start with Section 1. In section 1, we're going to talk about the origins of progress progressivism, basically what progressivism was all about and the problems that they addressed in society. You can see the definition there, the progressive movement aimed to restore economic opportunities and correct social injustices. The economic opportunities for the individual, um, for the longest time, the businesses were unharnessed and running rampant and running wild, again, at the uh, expense of the consumer. And then the social injustices, the, the horrible working conditions in the factories and the, in the tenements in the big cities, again, all uh, at the cost of the individual while the, uh, the the robber barons and the wealthy businesses uh, lived in uh, just absolute wealth and prosperity. Progressives accuse large corporations of ruining America, and again, um, the government starts to listen to these people. Uh, they start to demand that the government step in and respond. So we start to see a movement from no government intervention to just a little bit of government intervention and a little bit more and more and more until eventually we have a lot of government restrictions and a lot of government regulation to like we are, have today. Four areas um, that the progressives really approached the, the, this reform, this movement. First, social welfare, then they get in and then, then they also deal with uh, reform in moral improvement, morals in society economic reform and then efficiency, fostering efficiency and the growth of, of, of efficiency. Not all progressives work together on every four goals, on all the four goals. Uh, some share two or three, some just work on one, but they all consider themselves progressive because they have uh, similarities of some sort. The first reform, protecting social welfare. The main goal of this reform was to help the people of society. Um, to counterbalance the the harsh realities of industry and life in the big city, Florence Kelly worked a lot with helping the uh, the needy families and the, and the children. Her quote here is it's really interesting to me. She says, "Why are seals, birds, uh, excuse me, why are seals, bears, reindeer, and fish, wild game in the national parks, buffalo, and migratory birds, all found suitable for federal protection, but not children? We can protect all these wild animals." But it's okay that our children are working in factories and coal mines and dying, uh, getting their limbs ripped off, fingers and toes ripped off, uh, dying in the coal mines. We'll protect our animals, but we won't protect our children. So that was the fight that she went after. Uh, I'm going to show you a quick video here um, about one aspect of social reform. in the progressive era about prostitution and about regulation of it. What's really amazing about it all is that rather than focusing very much attention on the soldiers, everyone's attention got focused on the social lives of working class women and girls. Stories are told of middle class reformers attempting to close down dance halls, or even hiding behind bushes in Boston Commons, hoping to catch young women in the act of kissing, or some other unseen behavior. And so all kinds of women end up being caught in this dragnet. They end up either in prison, sometimes just in kind of performatories and schools for juvenile delinquents and so forth. What it shows more broadly is that progressive era reform included a really strong component of social control. And that a lot of the progressive reforms are ones that, you know, that sound good to everyone. Right? Let's have pure food and drink. 
But those reform movements also included things that, in retrospect, uh, I think most of us in the 21st century might find disturbing in terms of controlling people's social lives, controlling their sexuality, especially sort of working class people, immigrant communities, and so forth, who may have had different cultural patterns than those of the progressive reformers. So you can see that a part of that social welfare is not only protecting children, but also kind of cleaning up society. If we clean up society, then uh, maybe things will go better for the children as well. Next, we go on to promoting moral improvement. We see a picture here of Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation was well, well known for her busting up of the saloon. She'd walk into a saloon, ask them to sit down, or excuse me, ask them to shut down. And when they refused, she took her little hatchet to the bar, to the, to the bottles and everything, just busting everything up. And of course, you know, little old grandma, who's going who's gonna to harm a little old grandma? They just kind of got out of her way. Uh, but the moral improvement focused mainly on the temperance movement or, you know, getting rid of alcohol in society. Um, alcohol that was to blame for ruining families. Uh, the, the, the man of the house would work all week long, get paid, and on his way home he stops off at the saloon. And the next thing you know, he's wasted his entire paycheck on drinking and buying drinks for friends and buying drinks for ladies. And then the family has nothing, no food, no, no anything because they have no money. Uh, because he spent it all on, on drinking, and then they have to go the entire week scraping by. Um, so they decided uh, that this needed to be changed, that the people need to uh, go after uh, eliminating alcohol from society. Um, the problem with shutting down a lot of the bars is that the bars also served as banks and restaurants for the, uh, the neighborhoods, the enclaves, the immigrant um, places in the big cities. So if you shut down a bar, you're also shutting down uh, places to eat and also shutting down the bank banks where uh, a lot of immigrants kept their money or got their cashes checked. Again, let's watch a little video. Although reformers direct much of their energy toward political issues, they also crusade on behalf of what they term moral concerns, like the campaign to eliminate alcohol from the national scene. Prohibition is really an excellent example of the way in which moral values, religious values, influence public policy, become really central issues in the political arena, which is very typical of the 20th century at different periods. And so prohibition is an example of the way in which organized political pressure on the part of a variety of reform groups that include a lot of women's groups, such as the Women's Christians Temperance Union, help to get a national amendment passed that makes the country dry. In 1917, advocates of prohibition succeed in getting Congress to support a constitutional amendment banning the sale and manufacture of alcoholic beverages. Two years later, it is ratified by every state except Connecticut and Rhode Island. From the moment prohibition is passed, there are efforts to start the appeal process. There's some suggestion that people thought, oh, well, things like wine and beer would be available. But no, it's bone dry for prohibition. In fact, it probably did change drinking patterns because it's easier to brew a hard liquor like gin than it is to brew a lighter alcohol content like beer. But nonetheless, it's still the case that Americans probably drank less for this period. The people who wanted to drink did drink. So like they said, prohibition, uh, the WCTU did work uh, and gain a prohibition amendment. It's the 18th Amendment. And a lot of historians believe that th that amendment led to organized crime or the increased rates of crime uh, in regards to alcohol. We can get into that in a couple of units later on. Another focus of the, uh, the progressives was to create economic reform. Here we see a picture of Eugene Debs. Uh, Debs is a socialist. He ran for president a couple times. And let's read his quote here. Many of you think... You are competing. Competing against whom? Against Rockefeller? Again, Rockefeller being the, uh, the big banker during this day. Uh, Debs goes on to say, You compete about as much as I would if I had a wheelbarrow, and I competed against the Santa Fe Railroad from here to Kansas City. Essentially saying, you're going to compete against the richest guy in the world the same way I'm going to compete against a railroad if I'm pushing a wheelbarrow trying to beat it to Kansas City. There's just no chance. You have no chance. So, so, so the Socialist Party embraced that idea that the little man needed help and the government should be the one to help out the little man, take down the big man. Um, 
journalists. Uh, this is where we start to see a, a group of journalists called muckrakers uh, really diving in and digging up the dirt on these wealthy robber barons and finding out all the nasty, dirty things behind the scenes and uh, as a way to turn society against them uh, to bring down the big business. Uh, again, as you know, mo a lot of you know most about socialism is that everyone shares everything equally. Uh, again, another short video on this movement. It becomes obvious that one of the things that makes progressivism so difficult to decipher is the wide range of issues and concerns that attract the attention of reformers. In some ways, though, one issue tends to overshadow all the rest. And one of the core concerns of many progressives was what became known as the problem of monopoly, the problem of excessive concentration of economic power in the hands of a few people. At no time in the history of the United States do the critics of capitalism attract more support than in the period between 1900 and 1914. Although socialists agree on the need for basic structural changes in the economy, they differ widely on the tactics to use. Among the most militant groups is the industrial workers of the world. Now, the industrial workers of the world is formed in the first decade of the 20th century, and it's a coalition of radical groups, one of which is the Western Federation of Miners. The Western Federation of Miners is a trade union of miners, of hard rock miners, they're called, they mined iron and steel, copper and so on, all throughout the Western United States. Now these guys are not easygoing and laid back. They're fighters, they know how to use dynamite, they carry guns, it's the Wild West after all. The radical leaders decide that they need to form a national organization. And so they get together with a number of socialists, with leaders of socialist trade unions elsewhere in the country, and form the Industrial Workers of the World, which is a small organization, never more than 150,000 or so. But it's very, very limited. And it goes out to organize the people who the highly skilled craft unions are trying to organize. So they organize immigrant workers. They organize factory workers. They organized lumberjacks. In fact, for a while, you couldn't ride the rails as a hobo in the West unless you had a membership card in the IWW. They have some great victories, and they're able to increase their wages. But the IWW isn't just about increasing wages, getting better working conditions. They're also about social revolution. They want to overthrow capitalism and they become targets of a great political repression in the United States. Their leaders are jailed, they're charged with conspiracies, they're charged with sedition, a number were charged with attempted murder, their unions are broken up. So that response, while certainly a minority response in American history, had a very powerful effect. There's a great romance to the IWW. Many reformers agree with the socialists when they say that the greatest threat to the nation's economy is too much corporate consolidation. There is a call for the national government to do more than regulating big business. A great deal of what the government does do, and this is important, this is revolutionary in fact in the early 20th century, is they establish bureaus that keep track of what's going on. So you have a Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, the Federal Trade Commission, the State Commerce Commission, and what they're doing in this seem to be useful now is they're looking at the balance sheets of America's great corporations and saying this is how our capitalists behave. And this is an extremely useful and a new and politically revolutionary function because all of a sudden you have publicity for all kinds of chicanery. People can look at corporations to see where the uh, stock is watered. You're no longer dealing with anecdotal information, you're dealing with statistics. And of course statistics have a magical power to persuade. So the federal government is not able to establish a welfare state in a sort of modern way, but it is able to establish an information state which wishes people to seek labor legislation, welfare legislation at the state level, and they're often successful in getting it. Sometimes those laws are struck down with the Supreme Court too, but some of them endure as a sort of ongoing struggle. An ongoing struggle that, over time, will transform both the character of society and the nature of American politics. So you see, again, a big push to uh, bring down the big guy, bring down the corporations, and uh, help out the individual, help out the little guy, and spread the wealth, as they like to say today. Another aspect of progressivism, fostering efficiency, we start to see the use of the assembly line 
The assembly line is allow, allows businesses to create products at, at a rapid rate. Um, automobiles, the very first automobiles are sold at $1,000 a piece. And after the use of the assembly line and the imp implementation of that, we see prices drop to $650. And that's just because of the supply. Henry Ford is the first man to give his workers $5 a day, and everyone wanted to work for Henry Ford. Um, this is, again, at a day and age when most factory workers are getting a dollar a day or less. So $5 a day is just significant. Uh, it's a huge, huge improvement. And again, it's based on uh, the success of the assembly line. And then finally, government reform. We see government reform at different levels, local, state, and at federal reform. At the local level, um, we see little things like city councils and city managers just to keep an eye on the on the boss, not the boss of the political machine, something totally different, but the boss, the mayor, to make sure that he's doing things correctly and he has people that he has to answer to. At the state level, uh, regulating railroads and mines and mills, telephone companies, and then at the national level, see if you uh, recognize any of these things. Um, the secret ballot, referendum, initiative, direct election of senators. If that sounds familiar, well, it should, because those are all populists' ideas. I knew they'd come back, and I think I told you they'd be eventually be coming back. The populist group, you know, the group that's no longer in existence after the 1896 election, all of their ideas stick around and eventually get implemented into our government at this time. Sooner or later, most progressive programs require the involvement of government, or in some cases, the reform of government itself. Corruption among city bosses and state legislators in particular has reformers scurrying to find ways around both. The initiative really came in response to a fear that legislatures would not be responsive to the people. In California, for example, there were groups who were worried about the power of industrial groups, such as the Southern Pacific Railroad, being able to just stay in Sacramento and basically buy policy. To protect themselves, they wanted to give the voters a way to do an end around vis-a-vis -vis the legislature. They wanted to give the voters the ability to write their own laws and pass them in case the legislature was not responsive. And that accounts for the rise of the initiative and the referendum. If you look on a map, app, it's more prominent in the western states where the state governments develop later. Special interest groups, also lobbying for social reforms, often pursue their political process outside the party system. Interest groups are nothing new. All the way back to 1773, a group of Bostonians banded together as the son of patriots and dumped British tea in the harbor to protest the Crown's tax policies. If I ask my students or people on the street, name to me the provisions of the First Amendment of the Constitution. They might talk about freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. The ones who are really sharp will remember the right to assemble peaceably. Nobody remembers, you know, the right to petition your government. James Madison wanted to empower factions, not disempower them. Wanted to empower all of them to be able to compete because it's your government and what it does is affecting your life. And so you need the ability, as a citizen, to try to affect what your government does to you or for you. We have a representative political system. You have members of Congress, you have presidents, and they respond to the demands you place on them. If demands aren't made, they aren't likely to meet those demands. That's a basic truth of the American system. So there again, we see uh, the effort to clean up government and clean up, uh, to, to reform government, and clean up the business and, and get out all of the uh, the weasels, if you will, um, to again to try to make this little guy now uh, a little bit more equal with the bigger guy. So, four goals: promote uh, promote social reform, promote moral reform, um, economic reform, fostering efficiency, and government reform. Those are the four goals of the origins of progressivism. All right, watch this over and over again. Take notes, and I'll see you in class.